the, the, the hosts asked me to read the title. So the title is to be read as follows. Symplectic is to contact as Poisson is to Jacobi as affine is to projective. And uh, so first of all, let me thank the organizers, Alvaro, Martin and Marius for A, um, globalizing the Friday Fish, which every time I've spoken there, it's been a great experience uh, to be around friends who are very interested in mathematics. In fact, um, I hope this will be at least shorter than the first time I spoke in the Friday Fish. I believe that was a four hour talk. Um, so I, I will not give a four hour talk, don't worry. Um, secondly, I should say that this talk uh, is based as written with joint work with Maria Media Salazar and on some ongoing joint work with uh, Camilo Angulo and Maria Mela Salazar. And I think I forgot to, thank, to actually thank the organizers for inviting me. So the structure of the talk is as follows. I want to tell you a story and I will do it as follows. I will first introduce the main characters. Then I will tell you why I'm interested in this story, for some reasons. Then I will uh, tell you how to go from left to right or, or uh, right to left with some operations that most of you may know. And then I will start talking about some results. Now there is a warning. I have thoughts. So some things that I will talk about, uh, so the, the things that are more vague that I will talk about are completely due to me and the better results are probably mostly due to my collaborators. Okay. So we can now start and let's start easy. Okay, we, uh, I believe this community uh, studies, amongst other things, symplectic and contact manifolds. Let me remind to you, just to establish the notation, what a symplectic manifold is and what a contact manifold is. A symplectic manifold is uh, a manifold endowed with a two-form that is closed and non-degenerate. And we know that the second condition implies that uh, the manifold has to be even dimensional. And, um, the, uh, the first condition is a lot subtler in, in many ways. And let me just say a remark that may sound very vague, but will kind of, I will try to keep this remark going with me. It's in general not easy to construct, to determine whether a compact manifold, even dimensional manifold is simplex. It's, it's a hard question. Okay. And uh, so let me now, talk about the contact um, counterparts. Well, what I mean by a contact manifold is a manifold C together with a, um, a co-dimension one smooth distribution that is as far, from, uh, as far from being integrable as possible. And that is codified by means of this uh, map so you take two sections of h you do the lee bracket the lee bracket and then you project uh, then you take the part that isn't in h if you wish and you want this operator to be non-degenerate now let me stop here for a second and i forgot to say something quite important i do not like talking to a screen so please make yourselves heard in the style of friday fish so any question is welcome so contact geometry is often referred to as the odd dimensional analog of symplectic geometry. And one reason, to see, and one way to see this is as follows. Um, beneath uh, this definition, there is a line bundle over C, which is just the quotient of the, con of the tangent bundle by the contact uh, distribution. And the map that I've defined at the level of sections, this uh, taking the Lie bracket and uh, of sections of H and, and uh, quotienting by H, in fact, defines a map, uh, a C infinity, uh, well, it's, it's, a bundle, it's a vector bundle map from H to L, and fiber-wise, this is a, uh, the condition of non-degeneracy tells me that fiber-wise, this is a symplectic linear form, okay? So there is a symplectic aspect to the story, which kind of lurks underneath the definition. And 
let me just say one more thing. Often people think of contact manifolds as a manifold together with a one form that satisfies some, uh, some definition, some, some condition. The one form here would be uh, the one form whose kernel is precisely H. Feel free, if you don't like this formalism, to think of a contact manifold as a manifold together with a one form, but do not feel free to fix the form. Okay? So I am not a contact dynamicist. I, I don't like the red vector field. I don't have a preference of the, okay? And this is a very important point. And now this is a point that I'll come back to again, in contrast to symplectic geometry, and I will say this later, it is a lot easier to find contact structures on compact manifolds. Compared to symplectic geometry, contact geometry is much, much easier to, in, in terms of finding structures. Okay, and this is something that I'd like you to have at the back of your mind. Okay, so now let me, so here in, here in Rio, we, we have a, a relatively large community working on things more or less related to Poisson and symplectic geometry. And we kind of split between the non-degenerates and the degenerates. So I started with the non-degenerates and now I'm degenerating. So I'm going to talk about the degenerate versions of the two structures. See that I'm keeping what, what was right to the right and what was left to the left and what was black is black, uh, is black now and what is, what is blue is blue. Okay, so now the degenerate counterpart of symplectic geometry is Poisson geometry. Uh, well, this is a community that likes Poisson geometry, so I will just state the definition. I will think in terms of brackets just because I can. I have a Lie bracket on the space of, uh, of a Poisson manifold is um, a manifold together with a Lie bracket on the space of smooth functions such that contraction in the first, contracting in the first uh, component where the function gives me a derivation, gives me a vector field. Okay? And my favorite and your favorite example of a Poisson manifold for the purposes of this talk is this guy. So G is a Lie algebra and the dual of a Lie algebra comes equipped with a Poisson bracket that is essentially the Lie bracket. I mean, it's the dual of the Lie bracket, okay? I suspect that most of you have seen this. If you haven't, uh, I can explain it to you. So please make yourself uh, this. Okay. Now, I don't have anything to say about compactness and Poisson yet. Now, let me talk about Jacobi uh, manifolds. Now, Jacobi manifolds, have a, long, uh, have a different, more recent history than Poisson manifolds. They kind of coalesced from parallel work of Kirillov on the one hand and Nikshnerovitz on the other. And I will give you the, the definition that kind of comes from, uh, comes from Kirillov, but uh, there's a lot of Nikshnerovitz in it. And so now there is a line bundle. Notice that again, I see a line bundle. In what was blue, there's always a line bundle. And I have a bracket on the space of sections of this line bundle that is local. That means it satisfies this, um, this condition, which looks very abstract. The support of the bracket is contained in the section of the supports. And for anyone who is, a, I mean, who's like me, so a simpleton, this condition is fairly, it, it doesn't say very much. Um, there is some work that can be done to say that this is essentially equivalent to saying that contracting with the first, uh, uh, contracting with the section, it gives rise to a differential operator of order at most one on L. This is what Kirillov essentially proved when he was thinking about these things. So any questions so far? And let me, let me just say that your favorite example of a, of a Jacobi manifold in this talk will be very closely related to the previous example. Oh, I have to give you a line bundle, so I'm being sloppy. So now what you can do is you take a, a Lie algebra, you dualize it, and then you projectivize it. So you take, you remove the origin, and then you quotient out by the action of homotopies. Okay? Now there is a 
what I've just written down is the anti-tautological line bundle, whose sections you should think of as homogeneous functions, smooth homogeneous functions on the complement of the origin. And this, because the Poisson brackets on G star is linear, this inherits a bracket. Because the bracket of homogeneous things is again homogeneous. Okay? So there you go. And in particular, linear functions are homogeneous. Of order one. Okay. So now, so now I have to tell you about the third layer in my analogy. And this third layer is the one that you may be least familiar with. And for this reason, I have to take a step back and talk about what are known as GX structures. So you may never have heard of these, but you probably have heard of Klein's Erlang and Erlangen program. And this is an incarnation of a way to think about Klein's Erlangen program. So let me say that an action of a Lie group G on a manifold X is rigid if the only element that acts on an open set, non-empty, as the identity, is the identity, okay? Now this definition, the first time you see it, you go like, what? Okay, what you should have in mind, these are actions that are, if you wish, analytic, work like this. What I'm saying here is that if you know the transformation on an open set, you know the transformation everywhere. Okay, so this is the rigidity that I'm considering. And now using the, so henceforth, all my actions are rigid. So what is a GX structure on a manifold B? Well, it's some nice coordinates. And these nice coordinates um, are given, uh, are, have the property that the changes of coordinates are given by elements of G, okay? And here a subtlety arises, so first off, how is this different from the definition of any differentiable atlas? Well, G does not depend on the point. I mean, G is an element of a Lie group, okay? So it's, it's just a fixed transformation. Second, there is a subtlety here. This G only exists on any, there is a, such a G for any connected component of the intersection of U alpha and U beta, okay? But I, I want, I mean, I didn't write this down because I didn't want to clutter this with too much. I will give you examples, so don't worry. But now we, we I, 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 so I, I am not a very intrinsic person and I have, I, I seldom have discussions, intense discussions with Maria Melia, um, but one that we have is that I'm, I'm firmly in the coordinates camp and she's firmly in the, non in the intrinsic camp. And I think this community is firmly in the intrinsic camp. And I like that because you know, it's what I'm not. So I, I strive to be more like that. So let me give you something more intrinsic you can codify a GX structure equivalently as follows. You have a local diffeomorphism from the universal cover of B to X. And now you have a representation of the fundamental group of B to G so that this map is equivariant with respect to the fundamental group. Remember that the fundamental group acts on, uh, on the universal cover. And now using this representation, it will act on X. And now I want this map to be equivalent with respect to these actions. And you can check that these two things are analogous. And in fact, if you're more sophisticated than me, a much better way of, of, the, of encoding these things is really by means of the fundamental groupoid of B, but I, I'm a simple guy, I like, I, you know, I, I just say things that I understand and I, I, I think I understand the fundamental group point, but I think I, I kind of, have, I grew up accustomed to this. So you know, we, we like what we like. Daniele. See it, yes. Uh, this uh, notion of rigid, uh, uh -huh. it seems to be more like a effectiveness, you know, that uh, if you look at how the action of G is on a nearby point, uh, it is going to be an effective action. So in particular, I understand that this rigidness uh, uh, gives you the unicity on, on G, the element of the group giving you the transition between two charts. No, is, is that correct? The, the, the G is, is unique because of that, no? 
the G is unique because of rigidity. Rigidity is much stronger than effectiveness. So rigidity is a sort of, if you know, so the way you should think of rigidity, I think, so thank you very much for your comment. I Look at effectiveness, no? Uh, no, it's better than that. It's saying that if you know G on a small subset, you know G everywhere. Okay. Okay. So this, is, so this is so this is the whereas if you if you know that the action is locally effective, you don't know what the action looks like far away from where you are. So this essentially, yeah. So this is essentially how you should think of this condition. I'm I'm happy to discuss this later in detail. Should you should you wish to? Did I answer your question? Yeah, it's okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so now having told you what GX structures are, let me tell you the, main, the last main characters. Yes. Yeah, there seems to be a question uh, from Francis Bishop, but maybe it's better if he unmutes himself and asks, I think. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could say what the condition or what the definition of the GX so, in terms of the group uh, Right, so I can give you that. So can I give you that at the end? Because I think I have too many slides for the time allotted. So I, I will answer your question later. Is that, is that okay? Mm -hmm. But I, I will give you a short answer now. There is a representation. So you can codify this by means of a representation of the fundamental. So the tangent bundle to X becomes a representation of the fundamental groupoid of B. So I think this is the short answer to your question. Okay. Thanks. I think. Okay. So the last characters are the ones that most of us should be least familiar with. Okay. And I will define. So I will define four things here. I'm defining affine, what I call Z affine or integral affine, projective, and what I call Z projective. Now. This community, so let me, I, I'll say two things. This community knows a lot about symplectic geometry. So pres presumably knows something like the dauster heckman theorem or the Zanz classification of uh, toric manifolds or maybe the classification of multiplicity free actions. All these three things have to do with affine and integral affine structures. Okay, so you just didn't know I mean, it's not phrased normally in that language. So what is an affine structure? It's simply an, a structure, an, a GX structure, where G is the group of affine transformations of Rn, and X is Rn, okay? And an integral affine structure is just uh, the same thing, but now I insist that the affine transformations preserve the standard lattice for some obscure reason. I mean, it, it, when you look at it like this, you're like, what? Um, and then I will try to convince you that these things crop up naturally. Okay. So um, the other thing that I wanted to mention before I talk about projective is that unbeknownst to most of us, these things have been extensively studied. I mean, since the 50s. These are very, 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 very natural structures on manifolds. Okay, so if you Google, for instance, Goldman um, real projective structures, you will see papers that are very deep appear and that date back to the 80s. So let me tell you what a projective structure is. And let me make a note that my definition of projective has a little twist that is hidden in most of the literature, but I need the list, this little twist. And I still insist on calling things projective this way. So now my model space is RPN. And my group acting is the group of projective linear transformations. Uh, not quite projective. I'm only quotienting by positive things. Now, why am I quotienting by positive homotopies? Because I want to be able to lift. Okay, so this group PGL plus is naturally isomorphic to the group of uh, transformations, invertible matrices in Rn, uh, in N of, uh, group of invertible transform uh, real transformations, N by uh, N plus one by N plus one, whose determinant is either plus or minus one. Okay? 
Now, if you go to the full uh, quotient, this isomorphism kind of doesn't descend to say SLN plus one, always. It only descends when N is even. When N is odd, there is a, uh, an obstruction, which I don't want to deal with because it's entirely group theoretic and I don't care. Essentially, I cannot take the square roots of a negative, uh, I cannot take the nth root of a negative number if N is even. This is the problem, uh, okay? And now what is an, an, um, an integral projective structure? Well, it's simply thinking of the analog, the integral analog of, uh, of, the, of the above group. And now that turns out to be simply the invertible matrices over the integers. Okay. Now I, I know this is, this is more like strange. And I will say something about this in a, in a second, but I told you that blue always carries a line bundle. And I don't want to lie to you, right? I mean, lying to you would just be bad. What's the line bundle here? I'm gonna tell you what the line bundle is. I will tell you the line bundle of the on the universal cover. Remember that there is a developing map. So I can just pull back the anti-tautological anti line bundle on RPN along the developing map. The developing map is, uh, well, I can just do that. And now because, because my, my, because of, because my, because the developing map is pi one of B equivariant, this line bundle descends. And here is the subtlety where I need to be able to kind of lift from the projective group to GLN plus one R, okay? So this is, so this, I'm hiding, the, the subtlety, but, um, but, but it's there. Could you quickly okay. remind of us what the developing map is? So it's associated to a, um, associated to any GX structure, there is a local diffeomorphism that goes from the universal cover to the model space. So the idea, so Aldo, in terms of coordinates, the idea is you fix a coordinate patch and now you use rigidity of the action to extend this map along paths, right? Because what, what is the universal cover? It's the space of paths up to homotopy, uh, pointed if you wish. And, and then you can check that this construction actually carries out and it's well defined. Okay, right, I hope thanks. I answered your question. Okay. This is not oh. unique. Hmm? There is this, no unique. This is not unique. Fantastic point, Francis. Thank you very much. It's only unique up to uh, conjugation by the action of. Uh, so it, it clearly depends on a number of choices that I make. I can, I can make. So in terms of in thinking, in terms of choosing a coordinate patch, I pick. So I have to pick my coordinate patch, right? And then I have to pick lifts and so and all these things can be encoded by the action of the group g on x so you can conjugate by that action so this is true for any gx action fantastic but then the uh, choice of the line bundle how does it depend oh they're all they're all isomorphic well and and this is because you see francis and i'm, I'm working smoothly i'm not an algebraic geometer so every line bundle every non-trivial line bundle of a RPN is isomorphic to O1. I mean, every non-trivial one. They're, they're, all, they're all equally non-trivial from my point of view. This, but, but in any case, it's canonical. So the isomorphism here is canonical. So it, I, I have no problem, but thank you, thank you, thank you. This is a, a fantastic point. Any more questions? I, can I will clearly not get to the last slide within an hour. Okay, so, so I've told you, I've told you uh, about these guys. So why? Why do I look at this? And let, me, and let me give you a very honest, first honest answer that isn't here. I want to understand whether there is any point in studying what's the things in blue, especially contact and Jacobi. Okay, I've heard many people comment as to why would one study these things. So I, I, I asked myself, okay, why? Right, so I, I go back and I try and find motivation and it's for, for my own benefit. Now, I will give you three reasons. 
And in fact, the rest of the talk is a fourth reason. There's also an additional thing, and that is my collaborators complained that I haven't thought about this project for a while. So I had to get my ass in gear and think about it. So I, I had to, right? I had to. So if, I, if there was a mathematician that I wish I'd had met and talked to, that's Arnold. And Arnold, in a little known paper, one of the few papers in which he doesn't have 300 million uh, citations, called Contact Geometry Wave Propagation, he says, guys, you should think in contact terms and calculate symplectically. In the same way, you should think geometrically in terms of projected geometry and calculate in affine charts. And in fact, he kind of tried to bring, you know, to bring this forward um, a little bit. Now, in, well, I saw before I started um, some people that were attending, and there are plenty of people here interested in, con in the relation between contact and Jacobi manifolds. Let me just mention a few, and this list is by far not complete. So it's uh, the way I've learned uh, contact and Jacobi manifolds is through the work of Krainik and Salazar, but there is a different yet pretty much equivalent approach that Luca Vitagliano, Alfonso Tortorella, and others like Jonas Schnitzer have brought forward, which I, uh, it takes me a while to understand, but I, I think it's, a, it's pretty much equivalent to the way I understand things, but it's brilliant because in fact, it simplifies a lot of my things. So I look at their works and I'm like, oh yeah, this is how you do it. And then more recently, uh, very recently, there's been work say on contact dual pairs due to Blaga, Salazar, Tortorella, and Wiesmann. Uh, Recently in, in the Global Poisson, Eva Miranda spoke about joint work with her student Cedric Combs on uh, singular contact structures, so some sort of B or log contact structure. So you see, the community is active in this. And now I go back to this uh, little thing that I keep mentioning, and it's kind of very, uh, it's very vague. In some sense, compactness is easier in the blue context. So let me give you some, uh, some, some spurious reasons for why this is true. So the first spurious reason is the biggest thing I would say today, but it's, one of, it's a result that I don't understand because I haven't read the paper carefully, but it's, it's so I, 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 I quote these authors. So Bowman, Eliashberg, and uh, Murphy, they did the following amazing thing. They tell you to find a contact structure on a, com on a compact manifold, it suffices to solve the homotopic problem. I mean, and there, are, there is previous work by um, Pancholi, Casals, and Presas in the five dimensional case, and I don't remember who solved the three dimensional case. But this is mind blowing if you're a symplectic geometer. Go to any symplectic geometer and ask them, hey, I have an almost, a, contact, a compact, almost symplectic manifold. Is it symplectic? And they will just laugh at you. Because beyond dimension four, it's very, 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 very hard to solve this problem. These three people actually solve the problem in the contact setting, full stop. They, you, you, I mean, you solve the homotopic problem, goodbye, you're done. Now, let me say something that is cl much closer to home, and that is, I'd like you to contrast the following uh, results. So Milner proves that a closed surface, uh, let me just say sigma two for closed surface, is that fine if and only if its Euler characteristic is zero. So only the torus and the climb bottle supports, excuse me, um, affine structures amongst closed surfaces. Okay, so you see, compactness is hard for affine things. I mean, to them, if, if things work, if things are hard for surfaces, you know, my understanding of manifolds beyond surfaces is very sketchy. Now there's, there's a French guy called Benzecri I hope I pronounced his name correctly, and says, if I give you any 
closed surface, I can find a projective structure. Okay? Now look at the difference. The difference is astonishing. I find things are very special in the compact setting, in the two-dimensional compact setting. Say. Projective things in the two-dimensional compact settings is, so what? In fact, the seminal work of Goldman on uh, projective structures shows you that, I mean, for genus at least two, these things come in manifold, modular spaces of these things come in manifold-like things. And there's a beautiful theory of such things that is related to Teichmuller theory. You know, it's, it's just astonishing, okay? So you see, the, maybe these two things have very little in common, but compactness appears in both of them. So I just wanted to point this out. Maybe, um, maybe it's a coincidence that the first result works, I don't know. Questions? Okay, so now I've introduced the characters. Let me tell you what you can do. And this is, um, um, I've stolen or using a word that I've, I've learned from Luca in a paper that he's written with uh, Aisa Wade that appeared very recently, homogenization. So you can always go from blue to, to black. And let me tell you, so you can take a contact manifold and produce a symplectic manifold. You can take a Jacobi manifold and produce a Poisson manifold. You can take an uh, projected manifold and you can construct an affine manifold. But, and you pay a price and you see that compactness is something that I'm driving at throughout, you destroy compactness in, do, in so doing. So let me tell you about homogenization. So what do you do? Okay, so I'm using this L everywhere. So what's L in the first case? Let me remind you, L is the quotient by the contact distribution. The jewel of L lives naturally inside the cotangent bundle to C. It's the annihilator of H. And you can check that this is a symplectic, so that what I've just written down is a symplectic manifold. And it has the property that the projection to C, there is a projection to C, kind of respects the respective brackets in, in some suitable way that I do not want to go into. Okay, so it's, it's as good a symplectic manifold related to the original contact manifold as you can wish. The middle, the middle um, arrow, I will just not say anything about it and tell you, go read this beautiful paper by Luca and Aisa called, uh, it's, it's, on their, it's, it's their work on holomorphic Jacobi structures. Okay, and, and they explain things beautifully there. So I don't want to tell you this. As in, you go and do your homework, please. Now, the last one is interesting. So what's going on? Now I have to tell you what L is. Well, I, I know that L, so let me tell you, um, let me tell you everything at the level of the universal cover because it's easier. So we have uh, L tilde, I, I call the developing, the pullback of O1. So now I'm doing, so I can take its jewel and take away zero. This is, uh, well, canonically isomorphic to the pullback of the tautological line bundle minus zero. Okay. And now, well, remember that I had a representation from pi one of B to my, uh, group. Okay, so this is one of the things where I, um, and now I, well, you can check that pi one of this guy injects into pi one of B. And this guy, well, you can see it inside the affine transformations of Rn plus one, simply because of this thing that I can lift. So now I have a representation um, that uh, I have a representation from the right fundamental group to the right group. And what's the developing map? 
the new developing map is simply, well, I mean, this projects to O minus one minus zero and O minus one minus zero, if you remove the zero section from the tautological line bundle, you have a diffeomorphism onto Rn plus one minus zero, right? I mean, this is, this is the total space of a blow up. So this, this composite is the, the new developing map. And you can check that everything works and this will be an affine structure on, uh, on, this, uh, on, on the space, okay? Are there questions I see? I see there's activity in the chat. So Maria Media has a question and she's right next to me. So she will ask the question. So is it, is it easy to see this injection, the, the left? Hand side of the okay, so so you're referring to uh, so on the, at the level of fundamental groups. Very good question. So you can. Uh, oops, sorry. This is not with a tilde. This is without the tilde. So L star minus zero over B is a uh, principal R star bundle. So I can you I can look at the induced uh, long exact sequence in homotopy, and because the fibers are discrete. I get an injection uh, from pi one of the total space to pi one of B because pi one of the fibers is zero. Okay, so, in, so there is one small thing that I'm hiding here and that is normally when you think of homogenization, sometimes, you know, when you think of, oh, I simplectize a contact manifold with a one form, you, you don't get L star minus zero, you only get one of the two components. So here I'm, I'm allowing for things that are possibly disconnected. Okay, on the, on the, on the left-hand side. Did I answer your question? Maria Amelia is nodding. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So you can always, so, but this destroys compactness. And remember, compactness is your friend. I don't know if you have people that don't like compactness, but I like compactness in spite of mostly studying integral systems. Okay. Right. So now, Instead of promoting, I can include. But now I have to start being a bit more sketchy about this. Because so you can't see a symplectic manifold as a contact manifold, right? I mean, it, the dimensions don't match up. But you can see every Poisson manifold as a Jacobi manifold. It's, you just take the triple line bundle, and then the condition, I mean, the, the fact that uh, you have a Poisson structure tells you that you have a Jacobi structure on the triple line bundle. Maybe it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of cool that every affine structure can also be naturally seen as a projective structure. And this is simply by saying, hey, think of Rn as a coordinate, as the domain of a code, or the, co the codomain, if you wish, of a coordinate chart in Rpn, uh, Rpn. So let me formalize this in terms of this, uh, I'm thinking more, in terms of groups, so the idea is if you have an affine transformation of Rn, this is a pair A, B, A is the linear part, B is the uh, translational component, and there is a map to GLN plus one R, and this map is this one. Okay, so you just take the matrix so that the top n by n minor is a, the bottom one by one minor is one, above one you have b and below a you have zero. And this is now a, the embedding that you want. And, and the other information that you need to know is that Rn, well, I mean, Rn embeds into Rpn how x goes to the equivalence class of x1. I mean, these are charts, right? Now observe that this, I've, I've made choices here, right? I, I chose the one where it was just to make things appear nicely, okay? So these inclusions are not natural. They depend on my choice of seeing how affine transformations sit inside GLN plus one R. And likewise, when I think of a Poisson manifold as a Jacobi manifold, they're kind of making a choice because I, because I, I mean, there, there is a natural choice to make or as an easiest choice to make, but if I'm, if for instance, I multiplied my, 
bracket by a nowhere vanishing function, from the point of view of Jacobi geometry, this is the same thing. But in general, if you multiply a Poisson by vector or a Poisson bracket by a function, by a nowhere vanishing function, the result is not necessarily uh, Poisson. It's only conformally Poisson. So these inclusions are not so natural. But now there's another operation that I like that is not defined everywhere. I don't know how to define it for Poisson things, but I know how to define it for symplectic things. And I call it suggestively pre-quantization. And why do I call it pre-quantization? Well, if I have a symplectic manifold with an integral symplectic form, what I can do is I can take the principal S1 bundle Uh, whose churn class is omega. Okay, I'm ignoring constants here. There's, sometimes there's a two pi, there's an i, I, I'm ignoring all of that, okay? And now I can take theta to be a connection one form. And this will construct for you a very special contact manifold, uh, contact structure on C. These structures are sometimes referred to as pre-quantizations, hence the name that I suggest. And sometimes they're referred to as Boothby-Wang contact manifolds. And they have the property that with respect to this specific contact form that I've chosen, the red vector field that you may love and like uh, has all its, all its orbits are periodic and all have the same period. It's in fact the generator, the red vector field is the generator, the infinitesimal generator of the S1 action. Okay? But see that I can only do this if omega is in some sense integral, because otherwise this game collapses. Now, you see, this inclusion that I define here, going from affine to projective, collapses dramatically if you have, so if you, if you have, and so if you start with something that is integral affine, uh, the image of this inclusion is not in GLN plus one Z. And that is because I'm allowing the translational components to be real. Remember, this was, I defined it up there. So here, what do I mean by a strong Z affine manifold? I mean one, that has a, an, so its structure I want it to be, so I want the transformations that are allowed to not only preserve, so, I, so these are affine transformations that preserve the standard lattice and whose translations are integral. And now I can play, I can use the construction above and I get a Z projective, an integral projective structure. Okay. Right. So I've, I'm done with the constructions. Now, I will, so I will talk about um, some results. Okay, because so far I've, I've given you a bunch of constructions. I have to start say, stating theorems, right? Because otherwise this talk is nice and jolly, but where the hell are the results? Um, Daniela, maybe I have a quick question before of course. you say the next. So like to obtain like this, like um, symplectic with integral periods, you can usually like perturb a little and scale and then your symplectic form will be integral. Sometimes, uh, but- very like, I mean, very like you, you move it slightly to be rational and then you scale. Yeah. Something like okay, this. okay. So this is, is yeah. And does this exist in the other side in this affine case? Like, can you do some operation that turns your thing into- I, I think better. you, so sorry. Yes? I, I intervened. Um, your question is brilliant. I think it becomes a non-trivial arithmetic problem. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a sort of, I mean, you, you kind of, you, all examples that I know of, so for all examples that I know of, there's always a representative that satisfies this. But I don't know whether this is always true. So if I give you okay. an affine structure, say on a, comp, on a, com, on a compact manifold, and the affine structure be complete, whatever that means. So these are the nice ones. Mm -hmm. Then I can always find a representative that satisfies this. But then the examples that I know are very simple. They're mostly tori and bundles of a tori. I mean, no, tori okay, bundles, okay. bundles of a tori. So 
but it, a priori, it could be a non-trivial arithmetic problem. Sure. Okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. So let me give you this, uh, but thank you for the question. Um, let me give you this very simple observation. You can ignore the last item. So Ovsienko, in a short paper, kind of says, hey, if you have a simply connected manifold, and it's even dimensional, it is affine if and only if this thing that he writes is a symplectic form. And this is kind of obvious, at least one direction is obvious. Uh, you know, going the one direction is obvious. I mean, the developing map, its components would be F1 to F2N. And the, and the other direction is really just checking that the fact that this is symplectic implies that this map is a local diffeomorphism, which is not hard to check. I mean, you do the calculation, it's, it's not hard. And the second result is entirely analogous, but projective. I mean, now, remember, this is simply connected. So all you have to construct is this local diffeomorphism. And now you see you have 2n plus 2. So you have one more function that you expect than you expect. But that's because you, th you, you have to think of RPN as a homogeneous space, right? So you, you have one more function. And, and for those of you who like contact geometry, you should recognize the expression that appears within the parentheses as a multiple of the standard contact structure on the, on the sphere, which is, if you wish, the standard contact structure or contact form on projective space. I mean, if you like to think that way. And the last item is, okay, it's an item. It's, it's something I, I mean, at some point I, I kind of wanted to talk about integral, integral systems, but I decided not to. Okay, so let me, let me continue to try and convince you. I'm, I'm going to try and, and push into you the fact that you haven't seen this enough. So I think it was about Saturday when I realized that I should really talk about Lagrangian foliations. So if you have a symplectic manifold, a Lagrangian foliation is one, all of whose leaves are, are Lagrangian. And now, guys, I'm a simple guy. Foliations for me, I mean, this by definition has constant rank, but foliations for me always have constant rank, okay? I mean, I, I would otherwise use the word singular, whatever that means. And now, one of the first things that I learned in this business, way, way back when I was a PhD student, is this wonderful result of Weinstein. So he, in the same paper, kind of says, hey, everything is Lagrangian. So this is his advances paper. And then, he kind of says, okay, everything is Lagrangian, but if you have families of Lagrangians coming in foliations, then this is not the case. Everything affine is Lagrangian. And let me give you a very quick proof. I, I suspect that you may have seen this proof before. So one direction, so one direction is easy and the other one requires some work. So the local model, is, well, the local model is um, the foliation given by the cotangent bundle to a um, vector space. So locally, every Lagrangian foliation looks like the fibers look like cotangent fibers of a vector space. And then all you have to do is check that Symplectomorphisms of the total space that preserve the foliation induce an affine structure on, uh, so the changes of coordinates that you get by taking two such local models are such that on the fibers, you only see things acting affinely. And this is the case because the symplectomorphisms of this local model that preserve the foliation are very easy to determine. They're simply either cotangent lifts or translations by closed forms. I mean, it's a semi-direct product of these things. So this is the proof. I mean, there are details, but this is the proof. The other direction, so, so there is a Lagrangian foliation, I'll call it F0, on the cotangent bundle to R to N, or Rn, sorry. And that is, I take Rn 
oops, times constant, okay? Where the first Rn is the base and the second Rn are the fibers. Let me, let me make this clear. So now, so this is a Lagrangian foliation and the zero, and, and in particular, the zero section is a leaf. Now you can get a Lagrangian foliation F tilde on the cotangent bundle to B by pulling back along the developing map. Because this is a local diffeomorphism. Okay, and now the fact that your action is, your, the action by deck transformations is by affine transformations, this is exactly the condition that you need for the leaves of this foliation to go from one to the other because affine transformations in the cotangent components send constants to constants. And in particular, well, I mean, yes. So, that, so, that's, so then you get a, foli a Lagrangian foliation on the cotangent bundle of B. And the, so Weinstein says, hey, just take any horizontal um, distribution associated to an affine connection determined by this data. But this is the, con the construction. So I don't have room to, to, to write everything, but I said everything. So I asked, so any questions about these results? Which I think- uh, I Hi, Daniele. Yes, I actually have a question. Yes. Is there a similar result with integral of fine instead of a fine? Uh, that's an excellent question. I suspect, Rui, that you may have to require something in terms of the holonomy of the foliation at your leaf. So maybe with, zero, with trivial holonomy, you get integral of fine. I mean, it's, I the answer is I don't know but I speculate that if you have uh, trivial holonomy, uh, your leaf has trivial holonomy, then integral affine could, could occur. And some compactness, maybe complete, I mean, but, but it's a fantastic question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Sorry if I couldn't give you a better answer. Um, any more questions? So yeah, so last weekend I was like, okay, okay, I have to prepare this, but, but hey, I mean, I'm telling you a story and there should be a blue counterpart to this story, right? So this is all black. So the blue counterpart of Lagrangians are Legendrians. And Legendrians, they're slightly more complicated to define because you ask them that they be tangent to the contact distribution and on each, um, so, and given that they're tangent to the contact distribution, it makes sense to say that this subspace, the tangent space to, this, to your submanifold is in fact Lagrangian, okay? So if you ask contact topologists, they love Legendrians. I mean, Legendrians are brilliant. In three dimensions, Legendrians are essentially close, Legendrians are not. So wow, happy times. And you can prove a Weinstein type neighborhood theorem for Legendrians that involves something called the first jet bundle. The first jet bundle, so you have to fix a line bundle. Okay, in this business, you have to fix a line bundle. And the first jet bundle is, so the fibers are things of this form. I will write them and then I will tell you what, how to think of them. So the first jet, of a map is something that remembers its value at the point and the first derivative. So it's like the first order Taylor polynomial. But it's just an invariant way of writing this. Okay, so for instance, if L is the trivial bundle, then I, you get something, so J1 of L is isomorphic to the sum, the direct sum of the cotangent bundle at R. Okay, so you're remembering the derivative and the value. Okay, so you should think of this as some sort of twisted version of, of what I just described. Now, these uh, such first jet bundles come equipped naturally with a, with a contact structure, 
which in the case, I'm not going to define it for you in general, but in the case of the trivial, so L uh, trivial, I will tell you that H can is the kernel of dt minus the canonical divid form on the cotangent. Okay, I, I, I told you, I like coordinates, right? So I'm giving you coordinates. In general, there, there is a, like, like there is a very canonical definition of, um, of the canonical one form, um, for the cotangent bundle, there is a canonical definition for this one form, or for this contact structure, if you wish. But now, and now this is where, this is why the, this interlude does not include all the words, there is a problem with people. The, so in the, in the Lagrangian case, the fiber, so in the cotangent bundle, the fibers and the base, so the zero section, are Lagrangian. Okay, this is true. The zero section and the fibers in the cotangent bundle are Lagrangian. Dimensions don't match up here. So the zero section of the first jet bundle is Lagrangian, but the fibers aren't Lagrangian. They kind of want to be, but they're not. They're too big. In fact, they're not contained in the contact distribution. They're, they're in some sense transverse to the contact distribution. They have one direction that is transverse to it. And you can check this directly in, in, the, in this model that I'm telling you. So if I want to try and generalize this theorem by Weinstein, I have to look at some other model because this model will not do. Aha, uh -huh. and this is where the last word in the title comes in, projectivization. So now there is a different way of constructing a contact manifold starting from any manifold. And it goes as follows. You take the cotangent bundle, you have the canonical one form. Okay, you're in good shape, you have a one form. It's kernel, okay, it cannot be contact because the total space is even dimensional. However, you can remove the zero section and you projectivize, you quotient out by the action by homotopies in the fibers. And now, the, what you get in the end is a contact structure that I called in uh, inverted commas, the kernel of the, of the Liouville one form, okay? And now you can check directly that now the fibers of this guy, so the price that you're paying is that now you have no zero section. This is not a vector bundle, ladies and gentlemen. This is a bundle of projective spaces over Y. In particular, if Y is compact, this object is compact. Again, compactness coming to our rescue. But the fibers are all Legendrian. And that's because the fibers of a cotangent bundle are all Lagrangian. Okay? So then I said, okay, this must be known. There must be a theorem that generalizes the result of Allen to Legendrian foliations. And to my disappointment, there kind of is something almost like it. I mean, the heavy lifting has been done and there's something missing, okay? Well, and the something missing is I couldn't find it in the literature, okay? And this theorem, so you, a Legendre foliation is exactly what I told you. And now you can prove that a manifold is the leaf of a Legendre foliation if and only if it is projective. Now, this is kind of expected if you believe the story I'm telling you. But let me give you the proof. So Pang in his thesis, and that dates back to the, nine, the late 80s, beginning of 90s, does the heavy lifting. So the heavy lifting is using Moses method to say that the local model is the projectivization of the, of the cotangent bundle to a vector space. space, sorry. So the leaves all look like locally. So this is what Pang has done. So then 
But Pound was thinking of things in terms of contact forms. He really, his, the problem that he studied had to do with contact forms. He specified the form. So then specifying the form brings, it's like choosing, working, doing everything in projective geometry with one and only one set of affine charts. And this is very hard because you're missing things that, are, that, that you cannot check. So now you can check that contactomorphisms of this guy will induce a projective structure on the, on the fibers just as before the affine things uh, came from the symplectomorphisms of the other guy. And you could, I mean, you could homogenize, you go to the cotangent bundle minus zero, and then now you, 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 can, you have to rule out translations because the zero section cannot be moved. I mean, you cannot translate. So you only have linear things. And now if you only have linear things, this is pretty much the same as saying that you have a projective structure downstairs. And the converse to this, is well same as before but now the model so your model will be j1 of o1 sitting on r over rpn and this is trivializable so remember in the in the in the lagrangian case the model was the cotangent bundle of the model space in this case, it is, well, cotangent bundles, the, the, not the previous, but the, so this line here tells you that cotangent bundles get switched by J1s, get switched to J1s. And so you construct the J1 of, of this local, of O1 of this local model, and you can trivialize this. This is because there is a canonical choice of homogeneous functions on Rn plus one minus the origin, namely, projection onto each coordinate. And now the, the, this is a Lagrangian, so this is a, a Legendrian uh, foliation. And you can now carry the game that I carried before to obtain what you want. Okay, so now this is a good time for me to stop and say, I've gone through about half of what I prepared. Now, if you want me to shut up, I will shut up. So it is a good time for me to stop. Um, I unfortunately, and this is a disservice to my, uh, to my collaborators, uh, I haven't talked about what uh, we have done, but I, I, didn't, I didn't have time. Okay, maybe let's thank Daniela first, I guess, and we can have questions and continue a bit more later, I guess. So. Um, so maybe, yeah, are there questions uh, there? Just so I, yeah, I, unmute yourself and go ahead, I guess. So. So, so just before, so I think I essentially answered Francis' question that I owed to him, right? I said, I told, I haven't told you and I can, and I can tell you in, by email, if you wish, how to, how to define the, uh, the representation of the group one. But there is, as essentially, there is one. And if you want to see a concrete example of this done, this is very well explained in a paper in the affine case in a paper by uh, Rui, Marius, and David, um, the, what they call PMCT2. So in fact, this is where I, I learned it from them. So I should have said this at the time. Are there yeah, any questions for Daniele? I mean, if there's no question, I have a question. But, uh, uh, can, I, can I come back to... Uh, to a question of Alvaro, because oh, Alvaro's yeah. question, if I understood, was if you have an affine structure, can you perturb it to an integral affine structure? Yeah, that was the question, yeah. Mm -hmm. But this, this looks to me that it should not be possible, because there are examples of affine manifolds which do not have integral affine structures, right? Uh -huh. Correct, but suppose, suppose that they're complete. So, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. You cannot deform, I mean, you, in any, in any meaningful sense, you cannot deform a non-complete structure to a complete one, but then modify Alvaro's question to suppose that your structure is complete. So then I- So I you think, are saying that all known examples of complete affine manifolds are also integral affine? Uh, the ones that I know. And I, all known examples that I have played with 
uh, are also integral affine. That are complete. So the ones that I'm very familiar with are T2 and the Klein voxel, because I think those are the. Oh, yeah, that's in dimension two, but dimension two. But in higher dimensions, <laughs> I haven't seen a complete classification of affine structures, complete affine structures in higher dimensions. I, there may be one. I, I'm just ignorant of it. Also, for you, everything is compact. Also, for me, everything is compact. Please, yes. I I, I suspect. I mean, if you believe. If you believe something like uh, Auslander's conjecture, then I suspect that the answer for compact, complete should be, it's always, it should always be possible. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, you, you, you can see my face, right? I'm, I'm trying to look even uglier than normal. Um, but, um, but if you don't believe it, if you believe Marcus' conjecture, then at least you may have some hope of saying something. Oops, okay iPad wanted to lock. Um, yeah, but thank you, Rui. I mean, Rui's point is very valid. Are there more questions, comments? Um, okay, then maybe I will ask. So, yeah, I mean, so something you mentioned, right, is like this flexibility of contact, right? And Mm -hmm. In some sense, it's very related to the fact that contact is a geometry that admits like local scaling. So there's like no notion of a little ball in contact, like all contact balls are just the contact ball. But in symplectic, there's like this rigidity, right? You cannot scale because there's a volume sort of like, like dilating is not a symplectic transformation somehow, which makes it much more rigid. So something that people in symplectic topology seem to be thinking more about these days is like conformal symplectic. Right, because you get rid of this volume constraint and now it should be more flexible, right? So how does this fit into this picture? Uh, it's a fantastic point, Alvaro, because I forgot to say something. So there is a notion, I'm going back to my blah, blah of the why. There is a notion of um, something called locally conformally symplectic structures. So these are things that are, essentially these are symplectic forms that take value in, um, a flat line bundle where you fix a connection okay so this is not normally so this is so this is something that is in the language of uh, say that Luca has uh, developed um, a lot um, normally it's given in terms of some equations okay there's a two form that is non degenerate and there is a one form and d of the two form is the two form wedge the one form something like this and the one form is closed now Eliasberg and Murphy also proved a very nice result that says, hey, if you have a compact manifold, even dimensional, and you fix an, H, an element in H1, H, H upper one, then essentially finding a locally conformal, uh, locally conformal uh, structure, symplectic structure on this manifold with a multiple of that is always possible. So that is to say, once you give up once you allow for this, then you start seeing happiness coming in. And, and let, me, let me just say something here that, so in homogenization, you go from contact to symplectic, for instance. You could quotient by the action of Z. There is an action of Z. And now you don't get something symplectic in the quotient because this action of Z is also is doing this. Tum, 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 tum but you get something locally conformally symplectic. So you can always homogenize and preserve compactness if you're happy to give up um, symplectic. So if, if you're happy to work conformally. And this is particularly true. So this is true also for Poisson thing. So this is true for the three hours. And this is an interesting thing which says, hey, so you, st you can start with your favorite, um, you can start with your favorite projective structure on a closed surface of genus 15, say. You homogenize. Now this thing has homotopy type. So say it's orientable so that this thing, and we take only one connected component because it's, let me make my life simple, okay? So the thing on the, on the left will have the homotopy type. It's just R times your, your topologically, it's just R times your, 
um, your surface. And now you can act by Z. Okay, you can act by homotities. And in the quotient, you get an affine structure on the product of your uh, surface of genus 15 with S1. So you get examples where you get a compact affine manifold whose fundamental group contains as a subgroup a, uh, a, a group that has, you know, one of these surface groups, you know, like uh, the fundamental group of this surface of genus 15, which, for instance, as Ruim pointed out, in dimension two, this cannot happen. The group, you know, orientable, in, in the orientable case, it's abelian. So, but, I, but be aware of the fact that if you try and do this with something integral, you fail massively because these homotopies are not integral. They're e to some integer. Yeah. So, so this story does not carry well for the type of compactness that I like where there's a lot of integrality coming in. No, thanks, Daniele. Can I, can I be very annoying and come back to the question I was asking you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. So if, I, if I take the three sphere, it, it has no integral of fine structure, but it does have a fine structure. Really complete. And it cannot have it. Can. S3 does not have enough fine structure. It cannot. I mean, no? the development map would have to be a local diffeomorphism, but it cannot be. It's a compact manifold. Oh, I mean, yeah, I see you, you want, okay. Yeah, because I was thinking you could just define an affine connection by declaring it to be flat for the, you know, the three vector fields. But it won't be torsion free. Uh, I see, yeah, okay. Um, Thanks. No problem. And related to this, and this is something very good, Thank you, Rui, because I'm, I'm kind of eating your time. So feel free to disappear. I mean, people that want to stay, stay. People that want to disappear, disappear. I mean, I'm... Yeah, maybe something we can do is we can thank Daniela again, and then we all keep rumbling for a while, I guess. So maybe let's officially stop, and whoever wants to leave can leave without shame or, or so. <laughs> so thanks, Daniele. OK, now we can continue. So Daniele, go on. OK. so. So you see, as the point I just made to Rui is a point that I should have made, which is affine manifolds, so there is no compact uh, affine manifold with finite fundamental group for the same reason that I just gave you. Because yeah. if there was, there would, be, there would be a local diffeomorphism from a compact simply connected sure. manifold to, uh, to Rn. However, it's very easy to construct compact. In, uh, however, it's very easy to prove that the only compact simply connect the only compact manifolds that have finite fundamental group and a projective structure are finite quotients of spheres. Because if you have a developing map for the projective structure, then it's so you have a compact manifold. It's simply connected, so your developing map lifts to a sphere smoothly, and now you have a local diffeomorphism between a compact manifold. And a sphere. And now, guys, I mean, a simple topological argument tells you that it has to be a, uh, a, co a covering space. And, well, things are connected. So, <laughs> I mean, it has to be a sphere. And now you have a finite group, which, which, for instance, so here in this theorem of, so Pang goes to some length and invokes. Red stability to prove that if you have a compact, uh, if, if you have a compact leaf of a Legendre foliation with finite fundamental group, it's diffeomorphic to the finite quotient of a sphere. Whereas I've just proven it to you by means of this theorem. So you see, I so compactness again is much easier. It's I, I construct for you some examples. Okay, okay, these are at least you know I, I can at least do quotients of spheres. Um, and uh, in fact, I can do, I think, a lot more. There, however, I don't think it was known, but RP3 connects some RP3 does not support the projective structure. This is a result of Goldman with a collaborator, rel relatively recent, 2015. And so by this theorem, there is no RP3, where, uh, you, know, you, you, can, you can draw the conclusion of this, uh, of the theorem, right? I mean, if there is no projective structure, then RP3 connects some RP3 is not the leaf of any Legendre information. 
which I don't know if it was not. I mean, I literally woke up this morning, well, last night or at four and realized this. You know, kind of went, oh, okay, I can say this. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know if you want me to, I can give you a preview or a quick view of the rest. I mean, I, or if you want to go, you can just go. But it's, I mean, there was a, there was a lot more, but. I mean, I think it would be like in uh, Friday Fish Spirit <coughs> to maybe sure. at least get a bit of the whole story. I have, I don't listen, know. Daniel, I think you can go on and when you realize there is uh, only one uh, participant left, then you know uh, you should stop. <laughs> well, I, I'll go on, but I'll be, I'll be massively informal. Do you want... Mm -hmm. So I have, I have an, upper, an, upper, an upper bound of about an hour. So uh, do you want to still record this? Well, do you want to record this? Okay, uh, I, I can record it. But I'll, I'll I mean, we can more. always cut it, right? Like we can always like cut it in post, as, as they say in the business. So, so this, this, was, this was part of the story that I think people, especially so now, now we get into territory where say Rui and Marius are, are way more versed than, and David. And David, of course, I don't know if David is here. Okay, so the second part we, we recorded, but uh, uh, whoever wants to watch it has to pay. Exactly. Exactly. And royalties go to, I don't know, the funding for, uh, for, for, for a conference. Yeah. Um, so, right. So I, how did I come to study this thing? Well, I come from integrable systems and in integrable systems, our fine structures appear naturally through what I'm just going to introduce here. So now, so far, my story has not heavily featured Poisson or Jacobi geometry. Right? My story so far has been mostly about the top and the bottom layer. The middle one was kind of obscure. And the reason why is because I kind of secretly was doing things with the zero structures. So let me define for you something called isotropic realizations of Poisson manifolds, whatever the hell they are. So they're illustrated on your, right, on your left. They're Poisson maps between a symplectic manifold and a Poisson manifold such that they're subjective submersions, so that they are symplectic realizations, but I'm insisting that the fibers be isotropic. Okay, so that means that the restriction of omega to the fibers is zero. For instance, the cotangent bundle fibering over any, um, the cotangent bundle fibering over the, the space, right? Now, something that you get by simple uh, algebra is that the rank of the Poisson by vector cannot change. This has to be regular. And this is simply because, well, it's just, it's just a simple calculation. I, I, I don't want to say. So why on earth would you study this, right? I mean, this is a Poisson community, so maybe you think, hey, this is an intrinsically interesting object. So, so let, me, let me be the, um, let me be the, uh, the barbarian here. I come from integrable systems and these things model the regular part of non-commutative integrable systems. Okay, nice. Another thing which is closely related to integrable systems, but maybe it's more palatable to, to the people in symplectic, symplectic geometry, is that these things model the regular part of multiplicity reactions. Uh, under some small condition, but the small condition is uh, I want to rule out things like <coughs> the sphere acted on by SO3, okay? So uh, a multiplicity free action is an action that is effective um, such that reduced spaces are points. And in fact, I'm also requiring a sort of matching between the dimensions of this, the total space and the dimension of the group and the rank of the group. So for instance, in the abelian case, these are precisely, and my groups are always compact. In the abelian case, these are precisely toric actions, symplectic toric manifolds. Okay. Maybe now, maybe if you if you require the moment map to be surjective, then it's automatic. Uh, so, uh, submersion. Sorry, submersion in an open correct, set. Correct. 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 If I if I have to say that there are regular points, then it's automatic. I, I agree with you. Bruce. I agree with you that you can uh, that there are some regular points. And so. These things have been, ooh, did I make? No. Um, these things have been studied time and again. 
And so there's, there's a theorem that is essentially how I got involved in the story, which in the case in which the Poisson structure is zero is essentially due to Dousterman. And beyond this, it's due to the Zorin and Zan, but it's recently been revisited by Marius, Rui, and David. And Rui also has re-revisited -re things. So there, are, so there are several people here that have applied more sophisticated language than the one used by Dousterman, the Zorin and Zan, or the one that I am more familiar with. But, it's, uh, but for our purposes, our meaning Poisson geometers, uh, their revisitation, I, I, will, I will mention some of this, but their, their, their observations are very, very profound in some sense. So if I assume in addition that the fibers are compact and connected, the leaf space is integral affine. Now, the, the, the inverted commas are because the leaf space is by no means a manifold. So the, the way in which you normally phrase this, or the way in which I phrase it is that you have the symplectic foliation that I call F, and then you have something called the transversal integral affine structure. I don't want to define it, but it's, it's a kind of obvious definition that you would come up with if you think in coordinates. Uh, but if you don't want to think in coordinates, Marius, Rui, and David in their PMC22 have a nice definition that is very, very, uh, that, in, that it's in terms of uh, full dimension, you know, a full rank lattices in the conormal bundle, spanned by closed form. So I think that's, that's very nice. But in fact, these isotropic realizations, it turns out that you can abstractly classify them. So if you, can, if you, if you know the affine structure and some cohomology class, then you know the isomorphism type of these things, whatever isomorphism means, right? So this is a simple isomorphism over the total space uh, that makes the triangle commute, right? With the two projections. So simple isomorphisms between the total spaces that make the triangle, the, the obvious triangle commute. And so there's something subtle here, which it's, I, it, so, so Rui, for instance, thinks of this cohomology class as what I think he calls the Lagrangian or the equivalent of the Lagrangian churn class. I am more pedestrian and I learn things in a slightly different way. And so I, I kind of reduce things to calculating kernels of some homomorphisms and blah, 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 just because I wanted to calculate some things explicitly. And these homomorphisms that appear that I think at some point I call the the sort of the Zan homomorphism, they're kind of determined by the integral affine geometry. And that was what I essentially understood in my PhD thesis. Not that anyone cares, but you know, I, 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 I'm kind of very attached to this result, but it's close to my heart. I can explain it, but I, I, it's not the point. So, okay, so let me try and make everything red, or everything black blue. If I want to make everything black blue, first I have to give you motivation. And my motivation really comes from understanding multiplicity reactions in contact manifolds. Why do I want to do that? Well, aside from, hey, I apply this thing and I want to do it. So the, there was this relatively recent work of Abreu and Macarini, and they used the classification of contact or uh, manifolds to prove existence of infinitely many distinct contact structures in S2 times S3 with some properties. So you see, contact topology is much younger in some sense than uh, simplex topology, and still you can get some nice information from just this very simple example, this very symmetric example. So it stands to reason that perhaps if one develops the theory of multiplicity free actions on contact manifolds, one could um, extract some non-equivariant information that it may be of interest in, to contact topologists. Okay, so this is my blah blah. And I, and I also like to think about integrable systems on contact manifolds. For some reason, the, the literature is very fragmented on this. There are gazillions of slightly different definitions and none of them are what I like. I, I think I have one that I like and but at some point I may actually get someone or write it down myself. So, okay, what is an isotropic realization? It's what you expect, except it isn't, right? Because, okay, you start reading the blue. Phi was Poisson, now it's Jacobi. Ignore the fact that Jacobi maps need some relation. I mean, there has to be a way to relate the line bundle downstairs with the line bundle upstairs. Ignore this fact. You can happily ignore this fact. 
Okay, it's a subjective submersion, it's the same thing. And now you want to say that the fibers are isotropic. But it turns out that the right analog of the Poisson case is this case that is, so the fibers are transverse. So the first condition is that the fibers are transverse to the contact distribution and the intersection with the contact distribution is isotropic. And now if you've worked with contact groupoids, you kind of see this. I, I, I tend to think of realizations as some sort of uh, decategorified version. I, I use the word that I don't understand, but a simpler version of groupoids. Um, so it is what it is. Okay. There is another, I mean, you could think of the other alternative. You just say, hey, everything is tangent to the distribution and isotropic. But I think the classification is simpler there. For the, for the Legendrian case, I think uh, Robert Lutz proved some simple result. I mean, they all have to be something like the projectivization. They all have to be the projectivization of some cotangent bundle. There's not much geometry there. So, um, but, I, but I'm, 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 this is, these are things that I understand. I mean, this last thing I understand less, but I found the reference and I want to study it. So it, it would be nice, but this is the things, this is the type of things that Maria Maria and I studied. And we actually have a theorem, the kind can of I, general, yes. Can I ask you a question about this definition? So I, if I understand you can, you can define a uh, contact reduction, right? So you can also define like multiplicity free actions. Correct. And this condition that you have is, is just amounts to multiplicity free or? This condition, yes, yes, yes. The regular part of multiplicity free is, so we have a theorem, which I think is one of the things that I'm most proud of, I'm proudest of, um, that says, if you have a multiplicity free action in contact geometry, which you can think of, as you said, then there is always, and I will write it here, so if you have uh, G acting on CH multiplicity free, uh, there is a map, a smooth map from C to the projectivization of the Lie algebra of G star, such that, such that this happens on the regular part. Mm -hmm. So it's basically, it's the reduced spaces are points again. Exactly. So basically exactly. what that condition means. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. But you also, yeah, you, this condition is also the one that ensures that the reduced spaces are actually even dimensional. The first condition is the one that ensures that, even, that the reduced spaces are even dimensional. Because to be points, they have to be even dimensional, right? Sure. And in contact reduction, there is always this ambiguity that you could reduce and get something contact. Um, so, and this is a sort of moment map. And this is, so Maria Melia, I should probably put names here. So, Salazar and Sip. And in fact, uh, in, a recent, in this paper on contact dual pairs, the authors, who are many, and I like all of them, but I have many names, uh, they kind of say, hey, this happens for more general actions if the actions satisfy a sort of an analogous transversality condition. Um, so, and I, and, I, and I really like that proof. Um, so yes, so now, so these objects, okay, so remember, the isotropic realizations of Poisson manifolds had, were regular. So the base was regular. The Poisson manifold was necessarily regular. This is also true in this case, but in fact, it's even, even more can be said. All the leaves are even dimensional. And now, in Jacobi geometry, you have two kind of models for the leaves. They can either be contact or locally conformally symplectic. And I'm saying there are no contact leaves. And this, if you wish, is an incarnation of that first transversality condition. And then, and then what, you, what you expect, so points two and three are exactly what you'd expect if you believe me. So instead of Z affine, you get Z projective and you can classify. And the classification is very, very analogous, but now it, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny bit different. I, I mean, there are many analogies, but in, there is a, a long exact sequence of cohomology groups. And instead of looking at some bits, you're looking at some other homomorphisms. Um, so a bit earlier in the story. But then one thing that 
it's another thing that I really like is that you could ask the following question. You could say, right, I have a Poisson manifold and I can view it either as Jacobi or Poisson. And I ask, okay, if a Poisson manifold admits a contact isotropic realization, does it mean that it admits a, a symplectic isotropic realization? And the answer is yes. And it's an if and only if you impose that the, the form on the total space of the symplectic realization be integral. And then what you have is that, so you kind of, so you have these two, so you have, uh, so you have these two, um, so you have S omega, you have C, I will use theta because it's a prequantization. You have P pi, I'm switching notation here. And now you have two structures, two uh, geometric structures on the base. One that is integral affine and the other one which is projective. And it turns out that the integral affine one is, in this situation, the integral affine one is strong integral affine and it corresponds to the projective one and the prequantization. So if I prequantize the total spaces, I'm prequantizing the, the geometric structure on the leaves. In this sense, I have commutativity, which I, I, I particularly find it, I mean, I, I kind of like this. The, it's, it's wholly pretentious, this last line. I couldn't find a better way of writing it. I, if you have a better way of saying this, uh, please let me know. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is something that I think is extremely beautiful. And these are Poisson manifolds of compact types. I have contributed zero to this, but I, I still think that I should talk about them because I think they're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And having spoken to Marius, David and Rui about them, I kind of went back and tried to understand how they got to them. And I saw a paper that Marius and Rui wrote, I think it's a, this is in Travaux Mathematiques, Rigidity and Flexibility, and in Poisson Geometry, I think it's called. And, and they kind of asked the natural question, okay, now we have tools to, to, to study Poisson Geometry a bit more in depth. Can we find conditions so that we find a class of Poisson manifolds that are in some sense rigid, okay? And, and they were inspired by Lie theory. They said, okay, compact, com, compactly algebras, compact, compact semi-simple Lie algebras are rigid. I mean, they, they're, they're inspired by a lot of rigid results and they were brought to, I believe they can, control, I mean, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I see it, they were kind of said, okay, fine. Let's try and find a compact version of Poisson manifolds. And what they ended up coming uh, what they ended up with was Poisson manifolds of compact types. That means um, you, a, a manifold, a Poisson manifold is of compact types, of a compact type, if it admits a symplectic groupoid that is in some sense compact. And they have three different versions of compactness. One that is the strongest, the total space. So the, the uh, arrows are compact. The, the second one is the S map is proper. And then the weakest is the pair st so you get there are distinctions okay and then they have a strong version when they say the weinstein groupoid so the simply connected the source simply connected groupoid satisfies this and they always assume hausdorffness because they like because they like properness i mean they they like properness the way everyone likes properness with hausdorffness well everyone that is me um so what are examples of these things? So you have a compact symplectic manifold. Okay, you can, you can cook up a Poisson manifold of compact type out of it. Well, it is a Poisson manifold of compact type. If you have a, an integral of a manifold, you can cook up, uh, well, it, it is a zero, it's the Poisson, it's endowed with the zero Poisson structure, it's a Poisson manifold of compact type. Jewels of compact Lie algebras are Poisson manifolds of compact types. And then they bang their heads, their collected three heads looking for more examples. And they're very hard, to, I mean, they, they struggled for a while and there was, um, but they found one which is connected to an example of Kotschik uh, to do with Hamiltonian S1, um, symplectic S1 actions um, with uh, whose orbits are all contractible, right? I, I, I can never remember 
this. But it's a, it's a, it's a special example. It's a six-dimensional, so it's related to a six-dimensional symplectic manifold together with an S1 action. And, um, and, and the Poisson manifold is a kind of the quotient of this. And there is a nice paper by David in Negaciones in which he actually spells everything out. But in general, constructing these things is very subtle. It's very delicate. And I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I, I believe Luca, uh, who's now Rui's student and was, Maris, was in Utrecht before, constructed more examples in his master's thesis. Please, Rui, Marius, let me know if I'm saying something uh, Yeah, wrong. Luca, Luca's one. Uh -huh. So the, the example of Kochik, the leaf space is uh, S1. <laughs> And you can generalize to, a, to leave spaces that are tori with the standard integral of fine structure easily by taking products. And Luca did an example where the leaf space is a non-standard integral of fine torus. So where the, where, you, where the linear part is, a one of the linear parts is a shear. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, Rui. I, so it's, uh, yeah. So uh, I haven't seen that work, but- I, I, And these are strongly compact. So that, that's, so, so the, this these is are- hard. The, the, the most rigid, the most uh, uh, strict uh, definition, let's say. Yes, so thank you. And, and uh, at some, if, if I could take a look at these examples at some point, I, I'd be happy, as in, I, I'd love to see them. <laughs> um, so, Marius, Rui, and David, and I don't know why I say that, so I should say them in, all, in alphabetical order. So, David, Marius, and Rui, um, have been working on this for a while and they have a plethora of results. I mean, I think so far they've written, they've published in excess of 150 pages. Okay, so especially PMCT2 is in fact a monograph. And it's the one that I understand slightly better, parts thereof. And they prove a lot of astonishing results. And astonishing because they kind of bring together a lot of things that I like. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just so good. So if you have a regular Poisson manifold of compact type, the compactness kind of tells you that the leaf space has an orbifold structure. Okay, so this is good. You, you can do some geometry. Well, when I say you can do some geometry, a lot of the heavy lifting that they do is actually dealing with the orbifold case. You know, they kind of go and they do the hard lifting for you because they're, they're not scared of dealing with orbifold whereas I am. And, um, but in fact, the fact that there is a symplectic structure brings integral off and geometry. And how so, the, the idea is that they look at the isotropies of the, uh, at, at the isotropy groups. They have to be abelian because this is regular. So they're the tori because they're compact. And so they, they look at the kernel of the exponential map and they use the kernel of the exponential map to use the generators of the, of, of, this, uh, of this kernel to essentially define integral often coordinates. I mean, the idea is very analogous to the one described in, in realization, in isotropic realizations. It's, it's de facto the same idea, but you know, it, it requires work, right? I mean, there, there's something else there. And in fact, I tried to, I, I struggled yesterday and this morning with the best way of, of saying this in a concise fashion, in fact, most of their paper, you can summarize a lot of the results by the motto, the integral affine geometry of the base tells you a lot of the Poisson structure and vice versa. I mean, so for instance, they generalize the dastamat heckman result on the variation of symplectic forms, on linear symplect, uh, the linearity of the variation of symplectic forms for say circle actions or torus actions. I mean, this is, they, they give a, a proper setting for this. Um, they, they relate various measures that appear, and then in the fourth, I mean, in the third one, they kind of take it to the next level and then they singularize and go, I mean, they, they do all sorts of crazy things that I, I think are astonishing. And another thing that kind of connects very nicely with the, with the way in which I'm presenting things is that they identify what's known as a symplectic gerb, whatever that is, it's, it's a class, it's a homology class, if you wish, Who's vanishing tells you that there is a special isotropic realization of your Poisson manifold. So you see, 
these things are a sort of one step up from, uh, from previous ones, from, from previous, things, previous things that I mentioned, and they kind of bring them all together. Whoops. Ah, back. Okay. So at some point when I was in Utrecht, I, I heard Marius ask Maria Melia, so how about Jacobi manifolds of compact maps? But then, you know, I am obsessed with reasons, as in I don't want people to say to me, and they've done before at seminars, why would you want to study this? Everything is homogeneous. Right? I mean, and, and yes, correct. So why study projective geometry? You should just study linear algebra. Um, I mean, by the same token. So I will state for you this result, which seems to have little to do with uh, Jacobi geometry. And there's a beautiful result due to Yonutz. And that says, so in essence, Yonutz comes and has, as he's prone to do, and kind of demolishes, you know, kind of says, okay, now I'm going to solve an important problem. And what he does, he says, hey, I can describe all Poisson structures up to isomorphism that are close to the Poisson structure on the sphere of, uh, of the dual of a Lie algebra that is compact and semi-simple. I can tell you everything about this, locally about this modular space, which if you think about it, this is crazy. As in, if, if I give you a Poisson structure, you know, I give you, my, one of my favorite Poisson structures is the zero structure. So tell me something about the neighborhood of Poisson structures, a uh, you know, neighborhood of, uh, of this modular space in, near the zero structure, it's, it's impossible. But this is very, uh, he gets a very strong result. And the observation here, which, uh, so I, I, I made this observation one of the last times I, I don't drink coffee. So I, I drink coffee very, very, uh, not very often. And I had to finish a proposal for a, for a grant and I took, I drank some coffee and this came to me. I, I don't know if it's particularly profound, but maybe I should drink more coffee, I don't know. Um, it's the following. Um, so, okay, so before I make the observation, I should tell people that aren't familiar with this, you can fix, so the sphere, you fix the killing form on, on G. And then you take the sphere with respect to that killing form. And this will be a Poisson submanifold of G star. Okay, with the... So the observation here is twofold. So this guy is not in general uh, integral. except for some uh, simple cases like SU2 star, okay? But if you see it as a Jacobi manifold, I can give you a compact integration like this. Uh, but um, the, so if G denotes the, a compact uh, Lie group that integrates little g, this guy is a a compact, uh, so this is a compact integration, and it's contact, okay? And in particular, if g is Simply connected, this will be strong in, uh, in, in the language of um, uh, David Marius and Ruth. And moreover, if you, if you interpret your Lutz results in Jacobi geometry, it doesn't become a local description, it becomes a rigidity result. It tells you, hey, up to a conformal factor, there is nothing except for the structure that you have, which I think is beautiful. Of course, his conformal factors are only Poisson, but it, but it kind of begs the question, right? It begs the question of, okay, is this, is this, a, is this a phenomenon that goes beyond this specific family of beautiful examples? Right, is, if I study Jacobi manifolds of compact types under some hypothesis, can I prove some sort of rigidity? And observe that for symplectic, for, for the Poisson manifolds, of, the, for the Poisson counterpart, you almost never have, I mean, you, you never have rigidity. You can rescale 
the, the symplectic form. I mean, you, you, okay, you can call those stupid deformations, but you, they still are there. And this is again, back to the point of Alvaro that the scaling is not a symplectic operation, but it's a kind of silly operation. So, okay, so you, so you go away and try and define Jacobi manifolds of compact types. These are Jacobi manifolds that are integral and have a compact contact integration. So now I'm, I'm literally applying this thing and saying every time you see Poisson, put Jacobi. Okay. Now you see, David, Marius, and Rui had to sweat non trivially to construct a strong Poisson manifold of compact type. Compact. I did it for you in. Uh, in minutes. So on the one hand, this means that their theory, so what they have is very precious. These examples are very, very, very precious. On the other, these are the things maybe more frequent in nature and still may be tractable because of the same idea that having this compact groupoid lying around or compact like groupoid lying around will allow you for some control. You see that I can give you some examples. Now, the examples that I'm giving you have some red because there's integrality coming in. So for instance, a, any compact symplectic manifold is a Poisson manifold of compact type, but it's only going to be of Jacobi compact type. In fact, this is something that Marius in a paper with Chen Chang proves. Well, if, for it to be integrable as a, uh, as a, as a Jacobi manifold, it has to be integral. And the symplectic form has to be integral. You have to do pre-quantization, okay? So you kind of, I mean, this is kind of selecting symplectic manifolds with integral uh, cohomology class, which as Alvaro said, they kind of are somewhat, I mean, I can kind of, once I'm more, of course I cannot modify groupoids like this, but at least from the point of view of symplectic geometry, I can modify the symplectic form and try and arrange it. And they're kind of, I don't want to say that they're dense, but you can get very, you can get close to them at least. And then, okay, the analog of integral affine, integral projective hold, projectivizations. And in fact, you can, this is something that occurred to me this morning, because I'm, because I'm an idiot, only this morning, but it, but if you have a PMCT, and the total space has an integral symplectic form you can pre-quantize. And you get such an example. So I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Kochik's example should be of this, of this kind, right? So the groupoid that you get from there should be of this kind. But, but, but it's a calculation that, I, that can be done. And now, and this is, uh, so now you, you, we, we're beginning to study this, as in, I kind of have said this many times with people here in the audience and with bouncing idea, we've been bouncing ideas and, and I've been guilty of not working on this project because, because I'm just, uh, well, an idiot. And the theorem that we can present so far is as, is as follows, it has two parts, and it's way less powerful than what Ma, uh, uh, David, Marius, and Rui have. I mean, it's, this is baby compared to them. This is very baby. So in no way is this something like, hey, it's, it's some small steps towards. But the first property, and this is something that I have to thank personally Marius for, Marius for because it was, I don't remember, it was a tram in Zurich when we discussed this. And Marius kind of said offhand, yeah, this should work because of this. And I went away and it took me, you know, I, I, I understand nothing about groupoids. So I had to go away and interpret, you know, kind of decipher this and eventually I proved it. Um, it's, it's, it's not a hard proof, but you know, I'm, I'm a simpleton. And if you have a Jacobi manifold of compact type, essentially it is Poisson in disguise. What do I mean? Ignore for a second, so, Ignore for a second that you have, that the line bundle may not be trivial. If the line bundle is trivial, then it is conformally possible, globally conformally possible. So you've, you've just done, you've just chosen the wrong coordinates. You may have chosen the wrong coordinates. So you can always work 
with Poisson things, which means that these things detect Poisson manifolds. So they can, I can use this to, to find Poisson manifolds. And this should be compared to, this, um, to the result that Maria Melia and, and I have about isotropic realizations of Jacobi manifolds that the, all the leaves are even dimensional. This is, but this is better because having a group point is better than having the representation in some sense. You, you have more, you have more structure. And now, and this is very similar to the first item that they proved in the theorem that I showed, for regular GMCDs, you, you have exactly what you expect. The, you have a transversal projective. So you have a, an integral projective orbital. And this, is, and this is the bit where you kind of say, say you, you know, I think, I think in the paper that we will write, I will say, read that paper and replace D by J1. Because in this story, you have to replace taking the exterior differentials to taking the first jet off. And, and, and this is the proof. So what they did the heavy lifting and I just, and we just have this observation, replace this and it works. Okay. So there are many questions that arise from this. Uh, some of which um, I'd like to share with you. So the first one is, okay. So if I have a Poisson manifold of compact, so if I have a Poisson manifold, when can I, so, so, so and suppose it is of, Jacobi compact type. So it has a, a Z projective structure. So does it mean that I, under which conditions can I find, under which condition is it a Poisson manifold of compact type such that the total space of the contact is the prequantization of the symplectic and so that, I mean, and I expect that the, alpha, the strong integral affine structure becomes the projective integral structure. It's a sort of commutativity thing. Okay, I, I don't know if I've made this clear, but I think the idea is I want to pre-quantize the total space and I want to make sure that on the leaf space, I see the operation that I should see going from a strong integral affine to a Z projection. Okay, and, and essentially this is about saying something like the translational components in the integral affine structure of a PMCT should tell you something about the cohomology class of the symplectic form on the on the uh, arrows. This is something like that. Uh, there are some. A question is okay. Once once we've developed this theory, can 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 we hope to maybe extend Yonah's results? Maybe provide simpler arguments, given that we have a compact groupoid around that we didn't have before. Um, I, I don't know so much. I mean, I'm, I kind of oscillate between thinking that it's a good idea and thinking that you can't get much more than what units got. Um, give me examples. I mean, last time someone related to this project spoke about this project, Rui asked the very valid question of, can you give me an example other than the spheres? And I think Kochik's example, you can pre-quantize and, you know, but I'd like to construct examples that aren't you know, constructed by means of these simple operations, something more complicated. Maybe there, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Maybe there is. And related to this, maybe one can actually hope to classify what are known convex, what are known as convex integral affine um, structures on, uh, on surfaces. I don't know whether uh, inter integral projective structures on surfaces, whatever that means. And another thing completely, I mean, unrelated, but related to a question that we asked is, I kind of want to take the result about Legendre foliations and continue and, and kind of start extracting information. So that's, uh, so that's all I had to say, and I'm sorry if I slightly went over time. <laughs>